One of the questions that was posed earlier was uh, to what extent uh, drones will become ubiquitous or, or re will remain a niche technology. And uh, the most persuasive case I've heard for, for the sort of coming ubiquity of drones uh, was made by Daryl Jenkins. Uh, and I think everybody who's stuck around will be glad they did, and everybody who left will regret having left early. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very excited to hear Daryl speak, and uh, you all uh, will are in for a, a treat. So. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, my background is in commercial aviation. About three years ago, AUVSI called me up and asked me to do a uh, uh, economic impact study on uh, uh, integrating uh, drones into the NAS, which, which uh, I originally turned down for the simple reason uh, I'm an econometrician, uh, emphasis on data, and there was no data. Uh, we thought about it and we chatted about it for two months and decided that uh, uh, we would go ahead anyways, and um, I've had three years to think about that since. Uh, we certainly would do it differently now, uh, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, I've actually formulated, uh, it, the, the list is expanding. Uh, matter of fact, Joe Ironman added three more uh, economic laws to my list, and we're now up to 20. Uh, we had short time, so I figured we could get in seven. Um, let, let's start, I'm going to kind of give you a critique. What, what we're missing, all of us, I think, is vision. And what I'm going to conclude today is what ahead of us is so daunting that no current governmental uh, regulatory regime can handle all of it. And what we need to do is, as stakeholders, we all need to uh, uh, step up and, and be uh, much more active than we've been in the past. And one of the things I'm going to discuss is what I refer to as anticipa anticipatory regulation. And I'm going to skip through some of these. I, I, I want you to, as I go through this, I want you to keep two things in mind. One is scalability. These are two issues that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, think 15, 20 years down the road and think what the industry is going to look like, what institutions do we, are we going to need, and how many drones are we going to have in the air. That's scalability, all right? The second issue going forward, I think, is just as daunting, and that's the technology refresh period. In 1966, I was a freshman in college. Uh, these are the classes that I took. I was taking calculus, chemistry, physics, English, and a one-hour tech class. The one-hour tech class that I took was slide rule. Now, the young kids in here, you, probably don't even know what a slide rule is. Slide rule. Oh, do you? All right. All right. <laughs> All right. We, we don't use them anymore. All right? Uh, technology is changing very rapidly now. When, when I was a little boy, Technology changed, uh, uh, technology refresh was measured in terms of decades. Now it's measured in much, much shorter intervals. Oops. Let's go through these. First fundamental law of commercial drone economics. The higher you fly, the more expensive it becomes, all right? Think of capital and operating cost, all right? That's, that's number one. We're going to go through these, and I'm going to give you rationale. Now, appreciate the fact that I am data op, uh, intensive, and uh, I've had uh, the uh, opportunity to have a lot of private databases and go through some of these things. And I have a series of papers that will be coming out later this year where we go through some of these in detail. Uh, commercial drones are small, all right? And, and they're small so they can be more cost competitive. Now, I want you to think of this, not only commercial, but all drones in general exist because they are less expensive. And this applies uh, both military, governmental, and uh, commercial. Uh, the, the United States government went with the drones because they're cheaper. It costs a couple million dollars to uh, uh, train a, a pilot it costs $200,000 to train a drone pilot. Big difference, all right? 
uh, uh, Predators are, are much ex uh, less expensive than fighter jets. And Global Hawks, which are the most expensive, and their cost is equivalent to about a 737, 800, 900, something like that, are kind of unique. All right? I think your battery's running down. Is there a way we can move this? Oh, I, I, okay, uh, that's different than what I have on the screen. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, commercial drones are less expensive, all right? The reason is, is simple, all right? They're less expensive to buy than uh, uh, airplanes and helicopters. Uh, their usage of expensive fuel is low, all right? Uh, training costs are considerably lower. Jonathan, how long, how much did it cost you or Rob to learn to use a DJI Phantom? Lower cost. This, this reduces cost from your block hour cost from thousands to hundreds, all right? A big deal. The third fundamental law of commercial drone economics. This was actually suggested to me by somebody who works at the FAA who cannot be identified. All right, every three to five years, commercial drone sales will at least double. I believe that, all right? And here's some reasons why. Uh, pin up demand, so competitive that they're going to replace a lot of competitors. This is, in fact, a destructive technology. And the third one, which is interesting, is the short lifespan of the platform. Right now, when we originally did the uh, AUVSI uh, initial study, uh, Chris Malley and I uh, assumed a lifespan of a drone of 10 years. Well, <laughs> it doesn't work, <laughs> right? I've, I've gone through two or three in three years myself. Okay, the fourth fundamental laws. Right, now this is where it gets kind of interesting. About the fifth one, I start getting agitated, so just bear with me on this one. When, when you see me get really, really, really agitated, all right? As we move from line of sight to beyond line of sight, and I'm not really sure how far beyond line of sight is, all right? So it's beyond line of sight, but I don't know how far beyond that it extends, all right? To autonomous operations, the economic impact increases each time by an order of magnitude, okay? Now, I'm gonna just explain this one intuitively. Uh, line of sight drones are, are, are small and inexpensive. Because right, you don't need a whole lot. Now, uh, surveying and some mapping and stuff like that that you do with line of sight, you might be spending fifteen to $30,000. But in general, they're a lot less expensive, and you have a high volume of them. Okay? As we go to beyond line of sight, a lot of infrastructure, precision agriculture over very large fields and things like that, you have more expensive software. And so the price increases. In this market here, is indeed one order of magnitude bigger than line of sight, all right? Now, the number of operations for autonomous is excessively high, okay? Now, I'm gonna take you through some things here. Let's just use Amazon as an example, and I'm gonna first take you through what we know about them, then I'm gonna take you through what we don't know about them, okay? Uh, they have between 300 to 500 sales orders per second. Okay, so since I've said that, they've had another 1,000, okay? 85% um, of these are below five pounds. This is Jeff Bezos on 60 Minutes. It's all public information. Anybody out there can do the calculations. If we use a fraction of these to be conservative, let's knock it down by an order of magnitude, 30 to 50. All right, because when you forecast, you want to be conservative. We multiply that by 60 seconds per minute times 60 minutes per hour by 24 hours per day, let's say 300 days a year, with an average daily utilization of four round trips, which I kind of pulled out of nowhere. Then, dot, 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 we have a very big number. It is not a small number. It is a very big number. Now, let's... Let's go into what we don't know. How many places they can use this? 
the package shapes that will and will not work. Uh, how weather will impact operations, I don't know. Uh, how they will operate their command and control aspects, I have no clue. But I'm, that one's interesting. How often are these going to be need to be down for maintenance? And then the last one, just a whole bunch more things which we don't know. Okay. Now, if we look at the entire category of package delivery, I should have had Google up there. It is not unreasonable to believe that it will be very large. Now, if you were to ask me, Constantine, ask me, in your opinion, how many operations per day will this amount to? How many? About a million. At least a million ops per day. Now, how many ops do we handle a day in the airspace right now? 40,000 more or less. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I start getting agitated. <laughs> All right. Fifth fundamental economic law of drones. And this is where it gets interesting. Let's, we're still using Amazon. Okay. Um, I, I, I've, I've kind of gone through panels to get some of these numbers. But when they start operating, they're going to immediately drop the cost per unit delivery from about five bucks. Go to their annual reports to get these numbers. These are all public numbers. Anybody can do the calculations. The initial drop will probably be about two dollars. Now, um, I'm a mathematician. Okay, we have a, 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 an asymptote here going up to a limit, so we're, we're calculating the limit function. What's the limit function going to be? As, as the number of operations grow very large, and they're amortizing their software and their hardware over very large numbers, it's going to probably drop down towards about a buck per unit, all right, from $5 per unit now. This is going to push everybody who is in this area to an adopt or die mode, all right, and that's when drones are going to explode. Now let's put this into perspective. All right. Oh, six number. The system that will be needed to control this. All right. Now, I I like to think of myself as a visionary, but I don't have a clue. You, you're you're bright. You are bright, and you're a sweet boy. All right. <laughs> you invited me to be here, so I actually adore you. And if if I could, I would adopt you and put you in my will. All right. <laughs> Now, all that being said, young man who is bright and who I have a fondness in my heart for, all right, how are we going to do this, kid? I don't know. Either. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Does anybody in this room know? All right. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, I'm willing to go to that. <laughs> all right. All right. It, it's a big number, and it's a daunting task, and it's bigger than anything we've done before. Okay. And I had a real nice conversation with PK while he was in Istanbul on this. All right, now let's ask questions. Who's going to build this system? Who's going to operate it? Who's going to finance it? Where's the money coming from? Not from Congress. They're too stupid. And they're, they don't do things anymore, do they? All right? Who's going to come up with protocols? Who's going to regulate it? Well, I'm pretty sure the only one I know an answer to is the last one. It's probably the FAA. But who's going to do the others? All right? All right, big questions, big questions. Okay, uh, do we expect the FAA to come up with solutions? Well, they don't have a budget. Uh, they don't have manpower, all right? Now, to me, that's the good news because who's, who, who is the onus? Who gets the responsibility for doing this, all right? It's the stakeholders, all right? And, and I trust, I mean, appreciate my beginning assumption. Uh, I'm very fond of this kid. I hold him dear to my heart, and he's excessively bright, and I trust him. All right. If the commercial drone industry is to develop and grow, it's going to be because of stakeholder involvement, and we all have to be more involved than we have ever been before. Now, somewhere around early September, I'm going to do a webinar where I'm going to lay out the 20 fundamental laws, and this is the abbreviated version. 
All right? Stakeholders don't do it. Nobody else will. It's up to us, kids. That's me. Uh, if you'd like to be on my uh, bigger webinar, send me an email. I'm happy to include you in on it. And thank you very much for listening to me. So th thanks for that, um, Daryl. It's a pleasure also, um, I didn't see him in, as he was coming up in the room uh, before to introduce uh, Bradford Foley uh, from Gannett, who is a uh, uh, former Air Force pilot and still flies uh, for the US government in the reserve, I believe, yes. Um, but uh, flies uh, remotely piloted aircraft, uh, one of the many synonyms for these uh, airplanes we're discussing today, uh, and is also involved in the commercial drone industry uh, with uh, his firm. Gannett International um, and sort of knows all aspects of this industry quite well. So uh, Bradford and uh, Daryl will chat for a little bit and then we'll t they'll take some questions from the audience. So. Okay, so I'll, I'll stand there, I'll sit here. Uh, so I was an Air Force pilot, flying MC-130s uh, for the Air Force Special Operations Command and I decided to get out of the Air Force. I'm getting a job up in the hill working for a U.S. Senator, but I'm looking for a reserve job. And I get this call from a guy by the name of Snake Clark. It's literally the first name is what he refers to as Snake. He said, how would you like to go into UAVs? And I said, what in the hell are UAVs? And I said, you know, pilots, we don't fly UAVs. We fly airplanes. We're not going to fly UAVs. So in 2006, I, got, I went to my reserve uh, position over at the Pentagon, and I've been uh, uh, working with the Pred Reaper, Global Hawk, and even some of the smalls that you see that the Army uses uh, for, uh, for the last nine years. And uh, the interesting part of my job is, uh, in the reserve was having every conceivable industry come in and say, hey, we got this, we got that, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. Scratch your back with all this information and technology. So I, uh, getting out, I said, well, you know what, I should probably start a company. And I started a company with a bunch of guys out of that unit who have seen all the technologies out there that have been developed, researched and developed and put over there. And unfortunately, you can't test them here. You see, you test them over in Afghanistan. And uh, the technologies are pretty pervasive. So the point is, the technologies that we have used in the military and developed, that we have one for one brought into the commercial use of UAVs. And, and is exploding. And the UAVs and the commercial side, uh, from the platforms to the data integration capabilities to the sensors you have on board, are just unbelievable. And I think the objective here is just to kind of, for the commercial use uh, in the market, is to get all these things together and integrated. Um, I can talk a little briefly on the regulatory process and how we're moving from where we are today and where we're going into the future. And so, you know, a couple years ago, drones was just a bad word. Everybody didn't like to say drones. It had a horrible connotation. As a matter of fact, at one of the conferences at AVSI, the password was don't use the word drone. Uh, today, though, uh, with the community, they've done such a fantastic job of uh, promoting all the good things that the unmanned aerial systems can do. And so the community, and I think the general public, have begun to accept the utility of these drones. And not only that, but see the, uh, for businesses, they've seen the cost effectiveness. I mean, they're really, you can go out and buy a, an R, a 3D robotics a, a quadcopter for $999, or you can use a helicopter on an annual or a weekly or monthly basis and spend a lot of money doing that to get the same aerial photography that you, you may or may not want. Um, and so the, the great other thing about this and why it's exploding so much is the fact that Today, it's so, it's cost effective, but the technologies really are very basic. The software, the firmware, the platforms, using 3D printers to actually print the, um, the mechanical parts of whatever drone you're going to use is out there. And so really, this has been a next generation from what we saw in the, um, uh, the modeling community. So, um, so I think the bottom line of the commercial use is it, it really is ascending, it's getting bigger and bigger. Now, the regulatory piece is really the long pole in the tent. That's the part that's lagging behind everything else. And I will shout out to Jim Williams here. He has done a fantastic job when he was leading this with the FAA. A lot of people two years ago was just gripe sessions. It was complaining about the FAA not having rules for this. And uh, you know, there's a reason for getting into this thing. It's called safety and efficiency. And he's done a very good job of where we are today, uh, particularly our, now. One thing the FAA didn't do was keep to any of the timelines dictated by Public Law 11295. But you know what? Congress doesn't do their job either. So, um, and, and, and I, anybody in this room could say Congress did something that they said they were going to do is, 
is hard to find. So uh, the bottom line of the regulatory piece, if you look at what's happened, they put out their proposed, uh, their proposed rules back in February, but they, they did put out their uh, roadmap, their comprehensive plan. The test sites are up and running. They're actually making some money. And the great thing about the NPRM or the notice proposed rulemaking is, uh, you know, a lot of people thought because, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Section 333 exemptions, but they thought the NPRM would reflect that in terms of pilot certification. Well, you don't have that. All you have to do now is take a test and you are, uh, you know, register with the FAA and you're certified to fly these things. The, the, the private pilot's license has gone away. Now, some insurance companies will say, hey, listen, if I'm going to insure you, I think you need to have more than just a test. So you may, have, you know, maybe you find some certain instances where you do have to have some sort of hands-on experience. Um, and then the Section 333 exemptions themselves uh, have uh, really um, been uh, um, exceptional because the um, streamlining of the, what's the, what they call the Certificate of Authorization is not only for industry or individuals, but also for the test sites, uh, but also the summary grants. Basically, last fall, if you wanted to get a Section 333 exemption, you, you, I think you had to deal with a law firm. Today, there's 822 as of Monday. Um, uh, uh, exceptions that the FAA has put out there. Uh, there's 822 examples if you're thinking about writing a 333 to go to look at. Um, so the bottom line, I think, with the regulatory and the way the, the technologies are going today, uh, they are in a, in a positive trajectory. Now, I will say one last thing. The challenges still do remain. Everybody in this room has probably heard of detect and avoid, the detect and avoid, the detect and avoid capabilities, and how that uh, applies to beyond line of sight operations, because that's really the only, I think, the, the universal, the commonality in terms of a complaint as to what uh, still needs to be done. But, it, in terms of reference, just give you to where the military is on the detect and avoid capabilities. Uh, the Pred Reapers and even the Global Hawks have this capability. There's a 99% effective capability. It's basically a do regard radar. It's a um, uh, TCAS, ADSB, and a transponder. The problem is it's as big as a stage, right? It fits on a Predator, it fits on a, a Reaper or a Global Hawk. It doesn't fit on a quadcopter. And so really, in order to really get to that detect and avoid capability, I think that makes the FAA very comfortable, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a while where the miniaturization of the technology is actually fit. Now there's companies out there working on radar and acoustic uh, tech, uh, capabilities, and they're good, uh, but they're not really, I think, where, where the true detect and avoid capability is. Um, so, uh, so we'll get there. But, and Jim just said this, uh, next week up at NASA at uh, Mountain View is um, a very good, uh, I think, the introductory uh, session for, the, for NASA on kind of how we're going to deal with, we don't have the detect and avoid capability, but how are we going to deal with the uh, gap fill? And so this uh, UTM or this UAS, a traffic management system, uh, and how we can actually um, operate at below 500 feet with the drones and do so effectively. It will be presented and, and adjudicated. Um, you know, there's industry who are getting involved who at Google is doing a great job leveraging existing capabilities uh, to take two drones and have them communicate and so they don't hit each other. And then even the Pathfinder program that the FAA has worked on is going to, I think, um, produce some good information, just not just for line of sight, but extended line of sight, beyond line of sight. So it's all working. I think it's all going in a great way. I think the next step, as I will go out on a limb and say that the SUAS or the small UAS is really beginning to come on its own. The baby's beginning to crawl and trying to pull itself up on the furniture. But the next step and where the real technology comes in is when we start talking about the medium altitude and high altitude operations. This is where a whole new dynamic of industry comes into play who really were shut out of the, uh, the, um, uh, the small U.S. community who were basically developing these things in their garages. And so you have these massive manufacturers and integrators because there's going to be a lot of integration issues that come in. So where are we going? It, it's it's uh, the regulatory piece is coming along and I think the technology is already there. And so I think this uh, commercial use of UAS is, is, uh, is here to stay and it's, uh, it's really on a very positive trajectory. So. That's all I gotta say about that. <laughs> I guess questions. <laughs> There's questions for Daryl. Um, on your slides and through the media, we hear a lot about how Amazon's you know talk about the drone delivery. Um, where are the other delivery companies in this space? Oh. Uh, thank you for asking the question. I'll give you an honest answer. I don't really know. <laughs> it's not like they tell me anything. Um, 
what's interesting about both of them when you have a conversation with them is how little they tell you. Uh, I do know this. Uh, sensitive void is now down to 200 grams. Uh, we'll have a reasonably good systems that can operate with maybe up to five miles within a year. Um, um, some of the bigger problems in terms of command and control, which I consider that and the infrastructure the two biggest daunting problems out there. I don't think anybody has a handle on yet. Uh, I think the other things in terms of what I would call first stage beyond a line of sight, I don't think we're that far away from it. A, a year or two years, we, we certainly will have the ability to do that. And it'll be some sort of combination of onboard uh, detection and, not, uh, and, and a ground-based portable radar with that. Uh, the things that I'm worried about, I, I'm talking about the commercial space. I'm not talking about hobbyists or anything else. The thing I'm worried about in the commercial space in the short run is sense and avoid with GA and sense and avoid with uh, birds. Okay, th th those are my, my concerns. I have almost no concerns whatsoever about running in for a commercial guy running into a commercial airliner. Right. I think there are a lot of things we can do out there in terms of an industry that we need to be talking about. One of them are standards and licensing. Uh, I did a year's work with AUVSI and nothing else other than insurance issues. It was really interesting when you get and talk with the insurance companies how honest and candid they will be with you. Uh, two things. One, they want to they're, they're willing to do liability insurance. They're not willing to do hull insurance. The reason they're not willing to do hull insurance is because Germany, the commercial market, started up with no standards whatsoever. You have every whack job in the world buying a little drone. They turn it on and it's gone. They have no idea where it is and they file a claim. Okay? So you, you, you want some standards and you want licensing. Now if we have licensing, a lot of the other issues that we talk about, uh, for example, privacy, uh, are, are handled and can be handled easily because um, if you violate these standards, you can lose your liability insurance. If you lose your liability insurance, you lose your license and that's your, your lifeblood. All right. Now these are industry problems. I don't consider them governmental problems and I think there are things that we can do. This is going back to my fundamental premise, which I believe in above all else, is that the industry, so I'm going to be critical of the FAA because I don't think they do enough, and I'm critical of the industry because they're not doing enough in terms of organizing and bringing these things together. Now, unlike my young friend over here, I don't mind bickering. I think it's good, and I want to see some bickering, which just means an exchange of different ideas, but I want an adult in the room to bring these ideas to some sort of a uh, point at which we can all agree and go forward. All right? And those are the things that is an industry that we are not doing now, and shame on all of us for not having tackled these issues earlier. Did I answer your question? Well, I'm not sure of the answer. I think there's, uh, <laughs> there's uh, you know, Google, Amazon, there's a company called Quiqui that does, that wants to do pharmaceutical delivery. There's a company, uh, Flirty, that just proved here recently uh, in Virginia to deliver uh, thing. Maternet and Swiss, Swiss Post have, have, um, have partnered up on uh, delivery. So there's, there are companies that are beginning to move out on that. Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Um, I actually have some empirical basis for that. I, I, get room, I get a room full of engineers and we start talking about these issues. And I ask the question, uh, if uh, Amazon were to uh, make uh, 100,000 drones, uh, more or less at 50 pounds each, how much would it cost? If they were to make 200,000 drones, how much would it cost? If they were to have 500,000, how much would it cost? Okay, so you can set bounds here, and so I, I'm working on the assumption. Here are my working assumptions. 
somewhere they're going to be paying between ten and twenty thousand dollars per drone. So if you amortize that over the number of deliveries, that's where I come up with the, the probably it's going to start somewhere around two bucks, and over time it's going to drift down and trend towards a dollar. Okay. So um, I I didn't pull it entirely out of my butt. Uh, there is some data behind it, and, and it could be wrong, but somewhere it's going to be at least uh, half as expensive as it currently is, which is why these guys are so excited to do it. All right? Stock prices reflect future earnings, right? and they want to keep stock prices going. Amazon's going to be worth, they're going to have a market cap of a trillion dollars. How do you maintain that? This is how you maintain market caps of a trillion dollars. They're bigger than GE, to put it in perspective. Okay, So s somewhere around there, I think they're going to at least half it. And as they get this system going, and, and I'm not even, I, I think they could probably go 10 miles. All right, so if you're talking a 50-pound drone with a 4.5-pound package, which is your max, how, how far, given current batteries, can you travel, all right? Well, 10 to 15 miles more or less, not, not beyond that. So what, what I think we have in this number is I think we have accurately measured the constraints, all right? I can be off by a little bit, but it's going to be initially a big drop, and as they get economies of scale by going from 100,000 to 500,000, then that, that cost curve goes down drastically again. Did that answer your question? Uh, indirectly, because it, I think you alluded to the fact that if Amazon is going for a uh, one trillion market cap, then they essentially have the cash to do this development. Whereas a lot, of, whereas in comparison, other delivery delivery companies may not have the cash and well, the okay, capability. Okay, you, and you're correct on that. They have the cash. I mean, Amazon read their annual report. Uh, they have the ability, they, they get 30 days credit from all their vendors. They can sell under that 30 days period, they can sell one book five to six times. Where Borders would sell five to six of that book per year. So think of that in terms of cash flow. So they, they generate enormous cash flow by having that volume. They might not be the most profitable in the world, but these guys are sitting on Boku cash. And so the reason I, I use them is because they're the ones who are going to drive the market because they have the cash to actually go out and spend the tens of millions of dollars needed to develop all of the systems that go along with this. And they're the ones that have the biggest incentive, a trillion dollar market cap, which they're approaching right now. And so they're, they're the ones, or a Google or something like that, who is also cash flush right now, who have the ability to go out and change markets and make things like this happen. Are we getting, am I approaching an answer to your question asymptotically yet? <laughs> All right, perfectly good question. Thank you. Yes, I am willing to adopt you. Um, since the economies of uh, drone delivery are obviously going to be very sensitive to um, energy costs, I'm wondering if you have any perspective on uh, what the expectations would be for the impact on CO2 emissions f uh, for this future that we're talking about of possibly a million deliveries a day. Uh, you're out of my area of expertise. Okay, here's, here's what I, I uh, they uh, most likely are battery uh, driven. So you're, you have a power plant somewhere that's working to do it. Uh, some further assumptions, it's all going to have to be automated. So from the launch to the delivery to the landing of the drone, robots will handle it. So you're not going to see a, a line of drones coming into the warehouse and landing on the ground and a technician picking them up and taking them in. So a robot's going to have to catch them in the air the robot's going to have to put them into a case. The robot's going to have to recharge the battery. And then an assembly line will move that drone down to some sort of a conveyor belt where somebody probably physically attaches the, 
product, and that might be the only place where a human being is, is located in that system. In terms of CO2 uh, emissions, you're, you're way out of my area of expertise. There, there are platforms out there now that are being developed that uh, uh, use hydrogen fuel cells, uh, solar fuel cells. Uh, a lot of the persistence now, instead of having something that has to go up for eight or nine hours, there are companies out there that are looking to uh, have five-year persistence. And so obviously, uh, doing something like that, uh, um, using a solar uh, fuel cells, allows them to stay at pretty high altitude for a very long time. And uh, not only that, but they have to drive the pretty powerful engines. When you're talking about you know air airspace that high up, you're talking about pretty significant winds. So you have to have pretty robust engines. Um, so uh, the CO2 emissions itself, yeah, I don't know the uh, answer to that. Well, I certainly enjoyed being here, and I hope to go to Peru someday. Thanks,